On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, the Russian Navy has begun to board vessels sailing to Ukraine. Vessels locked up in Ukrainian ports since the start of the war have begun to break out. And we see Russian oil being traded above the price cap. The question is, has the Black Sea turned into a Block Sea? I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. Man, a lot going on in the Black Sea. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into this. So this is that video of the Russians boarding the commercial vessel that was sailing from the Turkish Straits up to the Danube River and eventually going into a Ukrainian port. This is the first armed boarding we have seen done by the Russian Navy. Now, prior to this, prior to the suspension of the Russian grain deal, vessels that were sailing up to Ukrainian ports, but only to those ports up in and around Odessa, were boarded by the Russians, but that was down in the Turkish Straits off the port of Istanbul. The Turks, the Ukrainians, the uh, Russians, and the UN had brokered this deal whereby all ships were searched to ensure they were not bringing anything up into the Ukrainian ports. However, those vessels that were going to Remy and Ismail on the Danube River were not searched. But this is the first time we're seeing this. And as this video shows, you can see the Russians going in full bore onto this vessel, searching the vessel, and determining whether or not there was any contraband on the ship. This video shows the Russians departing from the ship. They had parts of the crew muster up on the deck. You see them sitting there. And then a Russian Helix helicopter comes in to take off the Russian boarding party. Can I be clear about something? This right here is batshit crazy. I, I have the fact that this Russian helicopter is bouncing between the foremast of the vessel and the mid part of the vessel and the Russians are just climbing on board. <laughs> okay, I've done vessel boarding operations. I sailed for the Navy's Military Sealift Command for many years. And one of my most distinct memories, distinct memories, was sailing off the coast of the Virginia Capes while Navy SEALs and Special Forces did a boarding operations on us repeatedly in the evening. They brought helicopters, small boats, and there was a level of professionalism and craziness to what they did, fast roping down, attaching and being yanked off, all these crazy things that they did. But this bouncing a helix off the bow of the vessel and climbing, literally climbing on board and coming off is, is a bit crazy in my opinion. There's a lot of risk associated by this. Uh, Russian Helix helicopters have counter-rotating props. That's why you don't have a tail rotor on these. So they're fairly actually stable helicopters, but they're not big helicopters. And, and putting weight on it tilts the helicopter. Not to mention the fact the ship is, miss is, is, is rolling at this time. This is not how you would typically see it, either small boat or hoist uh, them up and down, not put the helo almost on the deck there, especially on a vessel this small and then climb on board. But again, hey, it's the Russians. It's what they like to do. So the first part here is the story of the, of the Hong Kong flagged Joseph Schulte. Now, Schulte is an operating company. They operate this ship for OOCL. OOCL is a subsidiary of Costco, which is the Chinese overseas shipping company. The Joseph Schulte has been up in Odessa since before February of 2022. It is the largest ship, container ship, that had been sitting in a Ukrainian port that had not been able to get out. Many of these vessels still retain crews on board that have rotated out. Other vessels have been abandoned uh, and, and basically lost. There, there's a whole slew of these vessels up there. But Schulte is the very first one that has broken out. And this is after Ukraine set up these corridors, these, these set corridors in which the ship can run. And there's been arguments back and forth on this that the Russians would never fire on a Hong Kong flagged vessel that is leased to OOCL a, under the parent company for the Chinese state. However, the ship hasn't moved for a year and a half. And it's only now that they move. And what's really interesting is if you look at the track of this vessel, this is the track of the vessel here on marine traffic. Here's the vessel breaking out of Odessa. It comes out here. They turn off their AIS in this run until the ship arrived off the Danube River. It actually anchored there off the Danube River. 
and then proceeded down to the Turkish Strait. But what's really interesting is it didn't proceed directly down to the Turkish Strait. It wasn't out here in international waters coming down. Instead, it hugged the territorial waters. Territorial waters are defined as 12 miles out from the beach of Romania and Bulgaria and eventually into Turkey. So even the Chinese are worried that the Russians would have stopped this vessel. Uh, I had people tell me that, oh, no, the Russians would never stop a Chinese vessel. That route right there indicates to me that they were not confident that that ship would not have been stopped and potentially seized or forced to turn back and head back into a Ukrainian or a Russian port and be seized by them. So the escalation in the war between Russia and Ukraine on the Black Sea side has increased. This story over in Trade Winds, key Russian Black Sea port of Novorosk hit by fire. There's a lot of debate about what this fire was. Initially, it came out as a grain uh, facility fire. But when you look at the images here, and there's video uh, attached with it, that you can see what it looks like is barrels, oil barrels, that are potentially burning here. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, debates about what this is. But obviously, it seems to be a strange coincidence that this is happening when then you see this story. Ukraine reports new attacks on the grain silos as ship sets sail. Russian attacks against the Ukrainian grain silos along the Danube River at Remy and Ismail. These are the two ports that are getting what's, what can get out of Ukraine by sea. Again, we're just seeing the escalation here, hitting these shore facilities between these two nations. Then come back to the story. This is the vessel that fired that shot against them, the uh, Vasily By Bykov. You actually saw her in the background of that video. One of the things is, is who they picked to do this on. This ship was flagged in uh, Palau. Uh, it home office of the vessel, which is a ship called the Sukru Okan, was in the Solomon Islands, but it's believed it is a Turkish-owned vessel. The Russians decided to stop this vessel and inspect it. Again, does this indicate an escalation? This is by a Russian warship patrolling between the Danube River and the Turkish Straits, and now we're seeing that executed here. And this story in particular starts raising up the question, is there a war generating on the Black Sea, or is Russia beginning a true blockade of Ukraine by cutting off vessels sailing to the ports of Remy and Ismail on the Danube? Has the Black Sea become the Block Sea? In the meantime, we're seeing ships backing up on the Black Sea as Russia's taking these warning shots. We're seeing an escalation in insurance costs to get ships up onto the Black Sea. We're seeing much more uh, kind of heightened concern by shipping companies to operate on this area, which all indicates to me that tensions are rising on the Black Sea. At the same time, Russian ports are chocker blocked, full of grain that needs to get out. All of that is having an indication here that we're not seeing the free flow of goods out of the Black Sea. Finally, there's this story over at FreightWaves. Greg Miller, sanctions on Russian crude and diesel exports are failing. Shadow tankers earn record premiums. Russian revenues rise. Go back to last year. There was a series of implementations done to set a price cap at $60 per barrel on Russian crude oil. And then in February, it was done on diesel fuel at $100 per barrel. However, right now, Ural crude is trading around over $70 a barrel, and diesel fuel is over $100 a barrel. Under the EU G7 sanctions, what they have done is leveraged against insurance companies. The insurance companies are supposed to not insure vessels that will carry cargo above that price cap. However, what we've seen happen is ships have been transferred over to the shadow fleet, this dark fleet. Ownership is murky at best. Uh, a lot of them are Greek ownership, but they're being transferred over. Russian ownership, we don't know. And they're getting insurance from other places that are popping up insurance shops over in Asia, uh, China, India, a few other places over in the Middle East. And I did an interview over FreightWaves, which you'll see right now to kind of give you the bigger picture.
Thank you, Kaylee. Super excited to be welcoming on our next guest, Sal Mercagliano, Associate Press Professor of History at Campbell University, but also maritime shipping expert. And Sal, super excited to have you on today and talking about the situation with Russia. Uh, when we're looking at especially the impact of sanctions, um, are we running into it? Tell us a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. I'm hearing mentions of shadow fleets, potentially more profits, and everyone may not be playing by the same rule book. Uh, it's great to be with you, Thomas. Uh, yeah, you got a lot going on right now in the Black Sea. If you look at just this past week, we've had the Russians boarding vessels. We have a ship that's breaking out of Odessa right now that's been blockaded in the port since the very beginning of the war. But the big story right now has to do with Russian crude and diesel. So back at the end of last year, in the middle of last year, you saw initiation of price caps. This was an effort by the G7 and the European Union to curtail profits to Russia for the selling of their oil and their diesel fuel. Uh, you have to remember, what the EU and the G7 didn't want to do was cut off the distribution of this fuel because it was needed worldwide. But what they wanted to do was minimize the amount of profits they could have. So they initiated these price caps. And the mechanism they use to enforce this is insurance. Basically, the EU and the G7 are leveraging insurance companies that if they carry, uh, if a ship carries fuel over the price cap, either $70 per barrel for, excuse me, $60 per barrel for uh, oil or $100 per barrel for diesel, then the insurance company should pull their insurance and the vessels will not be able to sail. And what we saw happen was the creation of what was known as the dark fleet or the ghost fleet or the Black Fleet. There was a couple of names for it. But these were operators that were really dealing with this Russian oil. A lot of them were mainstream companies that were doing this. But now what we're seeing is a lot of those mainstream companies are ditching away from this. And what we have is a batch of shadow companies, companies probably with Russian ownership, that are moving this oil and getting their insurance in other places so that they're not falling under these sanctions. So, Sal, good to have you with us as always. Thomas and I were talking during our last break about how this is kind of a, a very good example of just global politics, right? When you're looking at the G7 or the, the G7 countries, yeah, they basically had to do something, right? As you mentioned, they can't afford to lose the actual oil production, the commodity itself, but they also couldn't afford to sit back and say, we're just going to let it happen, right? You have to do something. That's politics. We knew that there was eventually going to be bad actors and people that came out and found some workaround around these rules. How are these workarounds now either impacting or supporting Russia itself? Obviously, the goal was to really not let Russia profit or do get anything good out of the continued energy trade. But how, how much are they profiting now from this? Well, obviously, they're not making the profits they would be making, but they are still profiting. We're seeing right now Ural Oil was about $71 a barrel. That's about $10 off WTI. Oil, again, that's $11 above the cap that's supposed to be out there. And this is actually having a twofold impact. Again, the G7 and the EU are trying to punish Russia by minimizing their profits. And what happened was these oil tank companies really used the process that has been used for moving Venezuelan and Iranian oil, which had been under sanctions previously. And so they create these kind of uh, shell corporations, these dummy companies. They get insurance in places like the UAE in China, in India. And so they're able to move this oil, especially when you see who's buying it. We know who's buying this oil. It's largely in Asia. India and China are consuming huge amounts of it. But what's happening right now is a lot of the carriers, especially these Greek carriers that were carrying Russian oil, now that the price has gone over the price cap, have now shifted back into non-Russian oil. And what that's doing is driving down the charter rates for their vessels. So that's impacting the Greek ship owners, which are the largest owners of tankers. And what we're probably going to see, and probably what's happening behind the scenes right now, is some of those Greek ship owners are working through these dummy corporations to get some of their tonnage back into this trade to be able to move it. The G7 and EU were really limited in the mechanisms and tools they had, so they're trying to use this economic leverage. But what we're seeing is it's not really working extremely well. 
And looking at the impacts of this, uh, you mentioned at a great point, uh, overcoming Iranian and Venezuelan sanctions. Is there a fear or a risk whenever uh, maybe abusing it too much to where it no longer has its impact, especially looking at insurances? Is the, uh, in a, I guess to, to put it in a better way, have we accidentally created an alternative or bifurcated the global ship insurance situation? Because now there's so much more premium for hauling Russian uh, distillates that we're going to see a whole new crop of uh, participants come up chasing this profit, and then in the future we won't be able to have the same kind of impact because we just used it up. Yeah, in many ways we've created this monster, and, and now the monster is, is kind of running the service. And we've seen the detrimental effect of this too. Let's not forget we had a tanker explosion this year, the Pablo. This was a ship that was carrying uh, what we believe to be is Iranian sanctioned crude oil. But these ships were executing the ship to ship transfers out at anchorages. And it's believed that this ship was not coming into any port where it could be inspected and their inert gas system went offline and you had a, a tanker explosion of the like we really hadn't seen since the 1960s and 70s. And so you're creating not just an illicit trade, but you're creating a trade where ships are operating outside of rules and sanctions. And this is the dangerous aspect is that we're going to normalize this. As long as I, Russia operates in this way outside the normal trade, outside the normal bounds, then there's very little regulation that could be put over it. And the fear here is loss of life, of, of environmental damage, but more importantly, it has also economic damage, as we're seeing. This is going to have a, an adverse impact on uh, ocean carriers for the movement of oil right now. And then when you add into it OPEC Plus putting in their restrictions in the export of oil, energy is becoming a big thing. And while you know Kaylee is talking about a heat wave right now, we need to be thinking about the winter time where we had such a mild winter in Europe and around the world. That was really a huge relief in terms of energy consumption. But if we have a bad winter, it's going to be really tough for a lot of countries to get the energy they need to heat their homes. And this is where we're seeing the LNG market expanding rapidly, uh, the movement of coal in large numbers on bulk carriers. And when you start eliminating such a big player like Russia from the energy pool, it has uh, kind of impacts down the supply chain. So we've talked to John Kingston a lot about this. Of course, he does all of our diesel and oil coverage for us here on Freight Waves. We've really started to hone in on just the incredible rise in prices on the benchmark diesel price that we've seen over the last month or so. It's up 36 cents from the very beginning of July. And obviously, Russia and OPEC Plus have a lot to do with that. What are your thoughts on the way that the diesel market is going and how much of an impact that things going on in Russia and what OPEC Plus is, has done now has on that? Well, I think what Thomas hit on just before is the key, is the fact that low sulfur diesel is going to be competing with trucks and, and ocean carriers. Because back in 2020, January 1st, when IMO 2020 went into effect and you had to have either low sulfur diesel in your engines for ships or operate through scrubbers, which scrub the old fuel, there are a lot of countries now that are eliminating scrubbers, and scrubbers are going to be phased out over time. Plus, scrubbers create a waste that has to be processed. And so you're going to see more and more ships shifting over to low sulfur diesel fuel as the norm. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on the diesel market. We're going to see that. We're going to see that on trucks. We're going to see it on rail. We're going to see it on ships. And until the new types of fuels can be developed for ships, uh, we're in that kind of interim period before we get to an area where we can be completely green in shipping. We're using a lot of experimental technologies, but low sulfur diesel is the order of the day. And we're seeing that. We're also seeing issues with contaminations. Uh, a lot of ships had issues coming out of Houston and Singapore recently with fuel contaminations. This is a big issue with the diesel fuel right now, is making sure that this clean diesel is getting in there. And so I, I think we can expect to see diesel fuel prices continue to stay at a high level because of the demand across the board. So thank you so much, especially as we continue to watch these developments. It's going to be interesting, but given how slow ships go, hopefully this stuff will stick around. We'll have a lot more to talk about. And we'll be bringing you on in the future as well. It's good to talk to you all this morning. I hope you enjoyed today's video and my interview over at Freight Waves. If you can, head on over to Freight Waves. FreightWaves.com have huge amounts of information available to you. They are a great source and I strongly recommend them along with G Captain, where I got most of my stories for today's stories from both Freightways and G Captains are excellent sources. In the meantime, 
I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the big super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon and you can become a patron of the page, either monthly or yearly or one time only. Till the next episode, this is Sal signing off.